Okay, welcome to the Memorizing Pharmacology podcast. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, Prazole, P-R-A-Z-O-L-E. I'm Tony Guerra, a pharmacist and pharmacology and chemistry instructor. And I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about why I kind of do this with the Word document. Uh, many of these names are very difficult to spell and certainly difficult to pronounce. And I want to make sure that uh, it's clear for you. Uh, I did have someone ask, could you just kind of zoom in a little bit? Uh, and that's what I've done. So you should see uh, the Word documents from now. You should see me zoom in. And as I'm kind of talking, what I'll do is I'll make sure to get these uh, underlined here. Uh, the errors or these uh, red marks are um, the uh, Microsoft Word trying to make it correct uh, or trying to correct uh, partial pieces because uh, what unfortunately happens uh, with this is that uh, it's looking at a stem prazole and saying well that's spelled wrong and it's like no that that's exactly what i want so uh, it's not spelled wrong as much as uh, it's just the way that word works okay well let's look at the suffix omeprazole or prazole uh, of omeprazole, uh, which is brand Prilosec, uh, with the prazole suffix P-R-A-Z-O-L-E, uh, which is a true proton pump inhibitor, uh, abbreviated PPI. Uh, we want to watch out for aripiprazole, brand Abilify, and Brexpiprazole, brand Rexalti, uh, which are antipsychotics, uh, not PPIs, but have the piprazole ending, P I P. R-A-Z-O-L-E. Uh, also, some electronic drug cards say the ending is azole, uh, but that is not an actual suffix. Uh, that is a chemical group. Uh, so using that ending might confuse antifungals like fluconazole, where conazole is the stem, uh, brand diflucan for PPIs. So again, the PPI proton pump inhibitor suffix is prazole. Uh, you will notice that omeprazole prilosec and esomeprazole nexium are very similar. And it's that omeprazole contains two molecules, a left and right mirror image, and esomeprazole only contains the left-handed image. In Latin, left is sinister. So the E, so the S, ES, represented, represents that only left-handed side. Uh, why does that matter in practice? The left-handed molecule is the active molecule. The right-handed molecule is inactive. So in omeprazole, you have this mixture of something inactive and active, and it doesn't hurt anything. It just doesn't have the active part, or it doesn't take out the inactive part. Uh, but in esomeprazole, it is only the active part. Okay. Uh, so the mechanism of action uh, will be our next step. Uh, the PPIs or prazoles work by blocking parietal cells in the stomach, uh, which release hydrogen ions contributing to the stomach's acidity. This, in turn, leads to heartburn or possible GI ulceration. Uh, the proton pump inhibitor blocks the hydrogen potassium ATPase pump, uh, preventing protons from going in the stomach. This raises the pH, making it more basic and removes the excessive acid. Now, a lot of what I said uh, is really clear if you had chemistry. If you did not have chemistry, uh, just the kind of takeaways that you need are one, hydrogen, which is the very first H on the periodic table, uh, can form into ions that make the stomach very acidic. And the way that we measure that acidity is through the pH scale. Now, <laughs> pH is the negative logarithm of the hydronium concentration, which is way probably more than uh, most need to know. But what the pH scale you do need to know is that the lower on the pH scale you are, one, two, and three, for example, are very acidic. And the higher on the pH scale, so which goes to 14, uh, 12, 13, 14, is alkaline or basic. So when you hear alkalosis, then we're talking about something basic. Or if you see hear basicity, we're talking about the upper end. The middle is seven, which is neutral. So let's give a couple examples just to kind of clarify this. Seven is neutral. Your blood is a little basic at around 7.35. And milk is a little acidic at 
a pH of like six. So why do some people give milk if they've got a stomach acid problem or something like that? Well, the stomach acid is around a two from one to 14, so very, very acidic. And milk is at a six, so you're still bringing it up and making it less acidic. And that's really what matters. So in this case, what a proton pump inhibitor would do is if there's less protons, then we would see that pH creeping up uh, from the traditional two in the stomach. And we'll see that that can kind of cause some problems later. But again, if you haven't had chemistry, uh, the big thing to know is hydrogen ions represent acidity. Uh, you might hear them as hydronium, which is H3O plus. So you're taking the H and you're adding it to H2O uh, which makes H3O plus. Uh, and again, this is, and again, getting into the weeds, but uh, it's going into the Bronsted Lowry uh, theory of acid base, uh, if you want to review that in chemistry. Okay. So, what do we use these for? So, we use proton pump inhibitors to manage heartburn, gastroesophageal reflux disease, or GERD, peptic ulcer disease, and Barrett's esophagus, which is where the acid reflux damages the esophagus, causing it to, to redden. Uh, many times, patients who are on chronic NSAIDs, so again, examples of NSAIDs are like ibuprofen uh, in the U.S. brand, Advil and Motrin, uh, or uh, naproxen, uh, which is brand Aleve in the U.S., or anticoagulants. Uh, they have a higher GI bleed risk uh, because of those medicines, and omeprazole is for prophylaxis. We're trying to prevent damage to the stomach, and uh, hopefully that works. Uh, pharmacokinetics, so standard dosing is to give the PPI 30 to 60 minutes before breakfast. Uh, and a concern that comes when the medication does not seem to work, uh, but it is not the medication, rather the patient is taking it with or even after breakfast. And I understand this. I'm busy, I've got three kids, and if I want to remember something, I attach it to something I already do. It's tough to attach something to 30 minutes before breakfast or 60 minutes before breakfast. It's easy to say, oh, I'm eating breakfast. I want to make sure to take my medicine. I'll put those both at the same time. So that's why it becomes a problem is because <clears throat> the patient's just trying to remember it and their way of remembering it is with meals. Uh, also, uh, H2 blockers like famotidine and maybe I should put something like that in there, F-A-M-O-T-I-D-I-N-E, <clears throat> which is brand Pepsid. Uh, these work a bit more quickly, so the patient might expect a similar timetable uh, with the proton pump inhibitor. Adverse effects, well, <clears throat> if you use it acutely for a few weeks, especially with over-the-counter protocols of you know just 14 days, uh, it tends to cause a few side effects, no problem. Well, hopefully. Uh, long term, however, we have concerns of B12 deficiency, increased fracture risk, uh, C. diff, which is an opportunity, uh, opportunistic infection. And where does that come from? Where does the B12 deficiency issue come from? Well, when you lower acidity, it's tougher for the body to absorb, at, um, to absorb B12. And then when you take away that acid, which is a barrier to most bacteria, uh, it's very difficult for bacteria to survive in that, in that kind of environment. Um, then it also makes it easier for other infections to come in. Uh, interactions. Uh, before we start the section, uh, let's remember, or here's a reminder, contrasting enzyme induction and enzyme inhibition. So a drug that induces an enzyme makes the enzyme work better. But that can be a problem because if you make the enzyme work better, it reduces drug levels and makes the patient subtherapeutic. So again, just like a submarine is below the ocean, a subordinate is below a superior, subtherapeutic means that we are below the therapy where we want to be. So again, an inducer makes the enzyme work better at breaking down the drug, and so our drug levels go down, and then the patient doesn't get as much medicine as they need. A drug that inhibits an enzyme, blocks the enzyme, uh, and it somewhat increases drug levels, making the patient toxic. So again, if we inhibit the enzyme, we block it, and we increase those drug levels, and unfortunately, the patient becomes toxic. So induction, the enzyme works better, 
but we have less drug. Inhibition, the enzyme doesn't work as well, and we have more drug. And in either case, we don't have the right amount of drug. But induction uh, and uh, inhibition, very important terms uh, to remember. And let's, let's use a, a good example here uh, where we can talk about the SIP enzymes. And I, I get it, many of you may not have to have SIP enzymes in, in the level of pharmacology that you're in. Uh, but what I want to do is I want to kind of go into uh, this because there's a great contrast between induction and inhibition. So I'll read this to you and maybe make a, a couple comments. So CYP2C19 induction with omeprazole and clopidogrel. Uh, clopidogrel is brand Plavix, if you're not familiar with it, uh, is one class example as clopidogrel is a prodrug. And by inducing the enzyme to break down more clopidogrel, the enzyme lowers clopidogrel levels. Okay, so a prodrug is one that is not quite the drug yet. Uh, the liver may have to metabolize it into a drug. A clopidogrel itself is an antiplatelet drug, so reducing the effectiveness of an antiplatelet drug while trying to prevent myocardial infarction, heart attacks, and strokes, obviously not a very good thing. And if you want to kind of look at the brand name Plavix, uh, you can see platelet, or the beginning of the word platelet, and then Vix is very similar to the word Vex, so kind of vexing platelets, not making them work quite as well as they should, uh, which you know, prevents that clotting from happening in the first place. But I think that's where uh, that name came from. Uh, Prilosec, just to kind of uh, let you know, it, so the, the name was supposed to be uh, Losec, but it was too much like Lasix, so they had to actually change the name. Uh, but you can think of Prilosec as protons and low secretion. So a low secretion of protons uh, is a good way to think of Prilosec as a mnemonic. Uh, so let's look at the other um, side of it. So that's induction. You're making um, an enzyme work better and the clopidogrel levels go down quicker than we expect, uh, which is not good for the patient. Uh, CYP2C19 inhibition can happen with citalopram, uh, which is Celexa, and escitalopram, which is Lexapro. Uh, and so this is where we kind of get into uh, the weeds with the stems. Uh, pram is not actually a stem. If we go into the long, long list, uh, it's not in there. But uh, we can take a look and see, wait a minute, I remember seeing esomeprazole and omeprazole, and there's that S he was talking about, the ES. Uh, and again, what's happening here is that citalopram was the first drug to come out. And what that was was the R and the S. And sometimes you might see it represented as a capital R uh, S like that with a hyphen in front of it. So R S citalopram, but uh, that just becomes confusing for a lot of people. So they just put citalopram. But this is just the S. So instead of putting S hyphen or an S in front of it, which make it like scitalopram, you know, the skittles of, of antidepressants, uh, it they put in S citalopram to let someone know that that's the S or sinister uh, mirror image side of Lexapro. Um, so Lexapro is the um, left-handed side only, just like S omeprazole is the left-handed sided only uh, side of that molecule. Uh, so in the, this case, the antidepressant drug levels can go up because if you're going to inhibit the enzyme, it doesn't break down uh, these drugs as well as we like. Uh, then we can have QTC prolongation. So again, uh, QTC prolongation is that uh, real concern uh, with arrhythmias and things like that. So that's why we have dosing maximums on citalopram of 20 milligrams daily uh, with someone on omeprazole or something like that. So why are these you know, interactions uh, so important? Uh, because we have a patient that is you know, with the induction, we have a patient who's trying to prevent a, a heart attack. And with the inhibition, we're, we have a patient that, on an antidepressant uh, that just happens to have some kind of acidic condition. And uh, all of a sudden, we're making them toxic uh, because we're trying to treat their GERD. And so that's why uh, it's so important uh, if somebody's on over-the-counter medicines uh, to let the um, uh, prescriber know. Uh, note, solostazole, uh, which is pletal, 
that's used occasionally for intermittent claudication, which is a problem with blood flow in the legs, uh, where they might be in pain for short distances. And this drug allows them to walk further. Uh, so pleatal, so you can see the word kind of platelet in there uh, to kind of remind you of what that's for. And intermittent claudication, again, that, that problem with the blood flow to the legs. Uh, so you may uh, know something that's called Raynaud's uh, syndrome, where you get the really, really cold extremities, especially the fingertips and things like that. Uh, this is uh, quite a bit different uh, than that one. Okay. Uh, so again, that's the, the real concern uh, there. Uh, with, uh, so some drugs also require an acidic environment. Uh, for absorption, and I talked about the B12 uh, above, but uh, cefuroxime, which is brand Ceftin, and this is a first prefix we've looked at. So Ceph, C-E-F, uh, in the first generation cephalosporin, it's actually C-E-P-H, uh, but cefuroxime or Ceftin is a second generation uh, cephalosporin antibiotic. It's got great, you know, gram positive coverage, uh, but uh, again, gram positive is the you, know, you can divide bacteria into gram positive and gram negative. Uh, gram positive means that it takes the gram stain because it doesn't have that kind of third layer and gram negative or where it doesn't take the gram stain. It's just a way to, to separate out uh, bacteria. Uh, mesalamine. And here's one that is a little more important when we get to something like bismuth subsalicylate. But that sal is a, a root, uh, meaning a, an acetyl sal. There's some kind of sal salicylic component to it. So acetyl salicylic acid, which is aspirin, uh, is, would have that sal stem. Uh, bismuth subsalicylate uh, is another concern. But that sal is a concern because you're not supposed to give children aspirin or aspirin-like products. And so that's what makes it like aspirin. It's that sal. Uh, but mesalamine, uh, which is pentassa, uh, that's good for uh, ulcerative colitis. And you can see the abbreviation in here for ASA, uh, which is uh, aspirin, acetyl salicylic acid, uh, for ulcerative colitis, and then iron supplements. Uh, they all need a good acid environment to work well. So uh, many different ways uh, that uh, we can have drug interactions and concerns uh, with the prazoles, and omeprazole, and so forth. Uh, but uh, again, knowing that stem uh, is really going to help you identify it at the most basic level, which is, what is this? It's a proton pump inhibitor uh, that reduces acid.